I'm really excited for today's stream uh, because I know that a lot of you guys have been asking. It's one of those areas that needs a lot of clarification and a lot of wisdom and training, for especially those of us who are young in the ministry of deliverance and who are not very seasoned, who are a part of this revival that is taking place in the United States, especially in the West among the young people. And so I believe that my guest today, he is no uh, stranger to a lot of you guys. But for those of you who are watching and you will see him for the first time, make sure you subscribe to his channel and make sure you follow him. He has been a great blessing uh, to my life personally, to our church. And I believe the Lord is going to use him and he has been using him to bring freedom, clarity and to bring a lot of insight into the things of the spirit, spiritual warfare. So without further ado, guys, please help me welcome Dr. Bob Larson. Hi there. <laughs> that's that's Buddhist. The sound of one hand clapping. That's an old okay, Buddhist we're gonna show. do both. So everybody, uh, drop drop that clapping emoji I in the like chat. The other people out there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I remember. Tonight. I've mentioned already quite a few times, and I'm going to repeat that again. Um, Reverend Bob Larson, I was introduced to your ministry. Uh, through TBN. That was 20 years ago. And our pastor uh, took us first to um, your uh, seminar in Portland area. I'll be very honest. I was scared. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I was young. I mean, I, I had demons at the time. I was not delivered yet. I just did not want it to be delivered, I guess, in public. And especially, uh, <laughs> I, I, I was just, I don't remember, I was scared. And so we went in there. I was a teenager and uh, our pastor was really just teaching us spiritual warfare. And, um, and then we got your tapes. Uh, thankfully, you know, started learning about spiritual deliverance. Then I went through my own deliverance, experienced that. And then we start practicing a lot of the methods that you introduced to, to the world, I really believe, or reintroduced to the world. We started to practice of inter interrogating the demons and, and all of this stuff and start seeing deliverance in our ministries. But before we talk about deliverance, I just want to ask, uh, first, you've been to Ukraine so many times and you've ministered deliverance in Ukraine so many times. You've done deliverance schools in Ukraine uh, many times. And I know that you love also Ukrainian people, Slavic people. Would you tell us a little bit about your experience of going there, what you've seen, what spiritual forces are operating there and, and what are your thoughts about this crisis that is happening between Ukraine and Russia? Well, thank you so much. It really is an honor to be with you here tonight. And uh say hello to all of the people who are normal viewers plus the the new folks that we're meeting tonight through your youtube channel uh i first went to ukraine more than a dozen years ago and i was invited by a group of folks who brought me to latvia it's while i was in latvia that i um uh met up with the the gentleman who was the founder of the new generation churches and so as a result of that, uh, I was introduced to this incredible movement of God among these churches all across Russia, Ukraine, and then on into Europe. And so it, after I administered in Latvia, somebody said to me, you know, you really need to go down to Ukraine. And uh, this is Pastor Alexei. And Pastor Alexei, I'll never remember, I'll never forget him saying to me, he said, you think the people in Latvia are enthusiastic? They're crazy in Ukraine. They're just crazy down there. And he meant that in a good way, you know. I mean, the, the fervency they have for the Lord. He said, it's, it's more so than anything you've seen in anywhere else in Eastern Europe. So we ended up uh, flying to Kiev and uh, going to Kiev back then and drove all the way down to Kershaw. Now that's a special place we've been hearing about because it's the first city that has fallen mm -hmm. in this campaign of Putin. So every time I hear about Kershaw, I'm I'm looking out at that audience of wow. a sea of hundreds and hundreds of people and seeing the manifest demons and ministering to them and praying for them. That's a special place for me. Uh, I've ministered in Crimea. That's special to my heart. I've ministered in Donetsk. In fact, during that period of time, I had the privilege of, of ministering. I don't know. I lost track. 50 plus cities all over Ukraine from one end to the other. 
But in addition to all of that, every year I would teach at the largest uh, Bible college and seminary in that part of the world, mm -hmm. which is located in this little town of about 20,000 people known as Prashatra. And I, I, I've i stumbled through that word because it's, you know, it's very hard to say. Prashatravats, that's a little better. And anyway, I thought, you know, they drove me to this little coal mining town in the middle of nowhere. And I'm thinking, what? The biggest Bible college in the continent is here? But it is. And I walk out in front of a thousand people and uh, they're from 25, 30 nations. About half of them are from Russia. Mm. Russia. They're fellowshipping. They love one another. Mm. There's no problem with Ukraine and Russia. So anyway, to shorten that story, that then I taught for a week. The first time I went there more than a dozen years ago, all day long, every day. I mean, they work you over there. And uh, and then, of course, after I've taught for six, eight hours a day, then we cast out demons for another four to six hours at night and to get you back up. The greatest food in the world, I'll tell you, the best place uh, of being fed was in Ukraine. Come on, greatest somebody. Cooked, greatest food because it's the breadbasket of the world. Yeah. You know, you know that. That's right. And so uh, everything is fresh out of the field. Yeah. Credible people. So anyway, I kept going back year after year after year after year. Uh, I was just uh, noticing on the news today um, in their in, in their hardar, uh, That's a uh, Ukrainian word. That's where the plant, a nuclear plant is located. Mm -hmm. In my mind's eye, they're talking about, they're bombing this thing. I'm thinking, are you crazy? I've been there. I've driven by that. It's the largest wow. nuclear plant in Europe. Wow. Supplies much of the electricity for Ukraine. So all these things are buzzwords. I've been on the Maidan. I've walked there uh, back when they um, overthrew uh, Yanukovych mm -hmm. and kicked him out because he was just a stooge of Russia. So mm -hmm. all of that is to say, my heart goes out to these people, and I want to. I want to make a couple of points here. The first point I want to make, if it's all right, take just a couple more go minutes ahead, on you, this. Ahead, is this is, in Putin's mind, a religious war. Okay, we need to understand that. He was infuriated that the Ukrainian Orthodox Church split off from the Russian Orthodox Church because of its alignment with the government. And he is determined to restore those two spiritual communions as one again. He sees this, among other things, as a spiritual mission. So you have to understand it in that context. And then, you know, you also have to understand this goes back to the 10th century and Prince Vladimir and the establishment of Christianity in that part of the world. And Putin sees himself as Vladimir again, Vladimir II, so to speak, who is out to establish his brand. I mean, he's not a spiritual person. That's obvious. He's right now a homicidal maniac, demagogue, dictator. But, but his mission is to restore what he believes is the power base of the Russian people, which is the Russian Orthodox Church. Mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, a story just came out yesterday in the British press about uh, Valerie Solovey, who's a famous political scientist in Russia. In fact, he uh, was a professor at the Moscow Institute of International Relationships relations, which is where all the spies are trained. Mm -hmm. He says that Putin is suffering from some serious disease and that he, wow. uh, with his main military leader, went to Siberia for a shamanic ceremony where they killed a black wolf so that that blood wow. would cure him of what's wrong with him and that would he would have victory in battle in Ukraine. Now, whether or not this story is true, it's coming from an incredibly uh, serious source. Mm -hmm. And it would not surprise me that that's the, the template behind this and that's what's really going on. So there's a lot more I could say, but that's my view. But I got to add one thing. 
Slavo Ukraine. <laughs> this was this is as you know, is the mace of Ukraine, which uh -huh. when Parliament is called into session, the president walks out with this, and that means that the government of Ukraine is in session. Mm -hmm. Session. This was given to me by the people of Ukraine. I carried it in my suitcase all the mm -hmm. way back. It's a replica of what they use in Parliament. So I raise this on behalf of the Ukrainian people and this incredible effort that you're making. Wow. And one more thing. I just got a, a letter today from um, Bishop Andre, who is the head, his personal friend of mine, of the 500 plus churches mm -hmm. of the new generation movement all across Ukraine mm -hmm. and all across Europe and Russia, uh, desperately pleading. We're going to help out on from our end by sending them a substantial sum of money to help out with the refugees. And he tells me the pastors are staying in place in Ukraine mm -hmm. to care for the people. They're not trying to get out of the country. They are there feeding yeah. them, sheltering yeah. them, providing yeah. them with transportation. Maybe you already know this, but thank God for those mm -hmm. godly pastors who are there on the job, not looking for a way out, but finding a way to minister to the needs of people. And God bless you. I pray that everybody shares a really generous gift with this mission that you have to go over there and help the refugees. Thank you. Thank you for kind words. And thank you for sharing that background history of uh, even what's happening, to providing a spiritual component to uh, the mind and the thinking of President Vladimir Putin. Um, Dr. Bob, how did your ministry of deliverance begin? How did that, how did God call you and how did you end up in the ministry of deliverance? Take us to the beginning. Well, at the start, uh, I was a, a rock and roll musician. I was earning money, putting myself to university with the intent of going into medicine. And then I became a Christian. And I wasn't quite sure where I should go from there until I felt I needed to take a step back from university and find myself. And I went on an around the world trip by myself alone, bought a ticket, took off. Well, some of the places that I ended up were like the Far East and India. And what most Americans don't understand is that the mindset over there is very different than it is here in America. Mm -hmm. The supernatural is part of their world. Africa, India, Asia, uh, they have ancestor worship. Even the Christians sometimes there play both camps. Uh, they keep attachment to their tribal ways or their clan ways or their traditional ways. So I saw all these ceremonies where people were becoming demon possessed. You know, they'd go into seizures, they'd foam at the mouth and they would scream. And, and, and the explanation was always the same. I, our gods are entering into us to give us power. Hmm. So I thought, well, this hmm. must be demon possession. I never heard about it in America. So I come back to America. I said, okay, Lord, if this happens in America, show it to me. And then a few years later, it didn't happen right away. People started coming up to me and, and talking to me and they would manifest demons. And I would ask pastors, you know, what do I do? And, well, are they, oh, they didn't know what to do. This never happened to them. Now, why is this happening to me? And so I realized there was a special calling here. Started to write books, begin to talk more on the subject. And then I got involved in uh, a nationally syndicated radio show, which we hosted for 20 years. And, and then people started calling my radio show and manifesting demons. And they, so I cast out demons on radio. <laughs> Who does that? You know, uh, I, I couldn't get away with that. You know, I'll tell you a story I've, I've seldom told. I remember one night, uh, I can still see myself. I was about maybe 10 years, eh, not quite that long, maybe eight years into this. I was in Cape Town, South Africa, mm -hmm. and I was, I was tired. I'd been cast out demons. I was laying there in the bed. I here I am. I'm you know I'm in my what early thirties, and I'm thinking, I can't take this anymore. <laughs> this is just too much, Lord. Nobody else is doing this. Nobody wants to do this. Why me? And I said, Lord, take this from me. Hmm. I can't take it anymore. The pressure's too great. 
Because you know what it's like in ministry and spiritual warfare. Incredible mm-hmm. pressure comes against you. Incredible criticism. All of those things. And I didn't hear the voice of God, but I certainly heard of my spirit. And I, I felt the Lord said to me, I'll take it from you for a season to recover. And then I expect you to go back and do greater things than you, you did before. And then all of a sudden, nobody showed up with demons for wow. a couple of years. Wow. And I had a space of rest there. And then I realized I didn't really want that rest all that much. <laughs> that that this I thrived on this. Wow. The the wow. excitement to see people set free in the name of Jesus. Wow. And then all of a sudden it came back like a flood. Wow. And it's been a flood ever since I've been riding that spiritual tide by God's grace and learning, starting the school of exorcism. And I'd only written a couple of books then. Now we're up to 40 plus books. And we just it just keeps going and going many, and going. And, and going. then for, for I you, a once in a while, she says to me, you really love this, don't you? I really do. I really do. Every day I see more miracles in one day than the average person wow. in ministry ever sees in a lifetime. I know you do too. Isn't that great? It's amazing. And, and uh, Dr. Bob, how many... I just want to kind of put in a context for our people. This is not just something you did many years ago. You wrote books about it and now you're just relaxing. How many deliverances in person, one-on-one deliverances have you done? And when was the last time you did the deliverance? (laughs) Well, the last time I did a deliverance was a couple of hours ago. Right in front of the same computer that I'm looking at now. Casting out demons from a woman from Africa who had been subjected to a tribal female genital mutilation ceremony, a coming of age ceremony. She has since been through three reconstructive surgeries to try to put her body back together again. And here I am talking to the demons in her and the witch doctor who did it and seeing this woman set free and released to become a woman of God, find a Christian husband and have her whole life restructured again. That's just one person today. And normally I deal with anywhere from six to eight people a day. You know, I know Everett's there with you. He has actually sat here and watched me. They just come one after another six days a week. Wow. I'm doing more than I've ever done at a more energetic pace than I ever have in my entire ministry. And there are no signs of slowing down. Wow. I love this. Don't you love it? Come on, somebody. Yes, yes, I do. If you guys show some appreciation uh, for Dr. Bob Larson, he's, he's a general who is still in the battle. He's not just somebody who's done it some 20 years ago and wrote books about it. He's in the battle today and this is this is incredible every time that i talk to you uh bob even one-on-one your your memory also is so sharp um i mean you're pronouncing ukrainian names better than i do um and your (laughs) his your history of knowing the history you guys you guys you guys have no idea how smart even just intellectually this man is and wise with all of these experiences as well as with the knowledge that he acquired. I wanted to ask you, the Thank Ministry you. of Deliverance was very unpopular in your day and age. What motivated you to choose such an uncharted path of ministry? I didn't have a choice. I really didn't. When God calls you, you may think you have a choice, but you really don't. Wow. Not if you're going to walk in peace. Not if you're going to have any kind of success in life. You must follow the path of God. But the turning point was when I was speaking at that time in one of the five largest churches in America. Mm -hmm. And I'm just new to the ministry and they invited me to come. And, you know, this was very heady stuff. Mm-hmm. I thought, wow, this is incredible. You know, I got 5,000 people listening to me. Wow. And I was very excited. 
that this pastor now was going to endorse me, so to speak, mm -hmm. send me on my way. Mm -hmm. And a very successful series of about, I think it was like three nights of meetings. And on the last night after everything was over with, a 15-year-old girl walked up to me and she said, would you pray with me? And I said, sure. And I said, what is the problem? She said, I compulsively masturbate and can't stop. I'm thinking, you know, who, who else are you going to talk to? And I said, well, okay. Whoever is causing this, I confront you by the blood of Jesus Christ. And just like that, she manifested a demon. Mm -hmm. So I did what I thought was the right thing. I called the pastor and I said, pastor, could we please go to your office with this young woman? Uh, she has a demon. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> this is one of the two or three biggest Baptist churches in America. Okay. It, it, but it could have been a Pentecostal church for that matter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we go to the pastor's office and he's got his whole staff there. And this demon manifests. And so then the, the pastor says, I, I, you know, what are we going to do? And I said, well, I think we need to have her father here. It turns out his father's a, the father's a deacon in the church. He comes over. They're all sitting there looking at me. And I said to the demon, how did you get this girl? And the demon said, pointed at the father, the deacon, and said, his pornography. Ouch. I said to the girl, is that true? You look at your, you found your dad's pornography? Well, anyway, the demon got cast out. She was freed. Uh, I went on my way. The next Sunday morning, somebody mailed me immediately a cassette tape. You don't remember cassettes, but they did oh, exist. I do. I do remember them. <laughs> I do remember them. Um, the pastor's Sunday morning message, and he got up, and of course, this this spread like wildfire through the church. Mm. He got up and in front of that huge audience, and he said, "Bob Larson is not a man of God. This isn't a church that casts out demons, and we don't believe in this stuff. Wow. And if you think you have one, you better get out of here and go somewhere else." And I was crushed because this guy was my ticket to success. Wow. And I was really angry with God. You know, I said, God, come on. <laughs> I did this for you and for her. And this is the thanks I get. And then a couple of days later, I got a letter in the mail. That, that, there were letters. We used to write letters. <laughs> so the texting anyway, the letter said from this girl, she said, I just want to thank you. She said, my whole life has changed. My dad uh, and I have had a, a long talk and he has apologized and he's, give, he's, you know, come back to the Lord. And we're just, the family is doing great. And I, I just want to let you know how much I appreciate it. So I remember to this day sitting in my office and I said, I felt the Holy Spirit said to me, who are you going to please? You going to please man? or me, are, are you going to help one person? Are they worth more than the thousands? And Pastor Vlad, that is a bridge that I cross that day and I've never come back. And I think when you're involved in this kind of ministry, you know this, you're out there on the cutting edge, you and Isaiah and the others who may be watching or are part of this new flow of revival that's coming. You've got to pay the price. One person, one person at a time, leading them to Jesus, seeing them healed and set free is more important than any accolade. So that was my turning point. Wow. Wow. That's, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. That I literally have goosebumps hearing. Uh, appreciate you sharing that story because this, I think this is a turning point for every person who is involved in ministry sooner or later you have to make up your mind. Are you going to please God? 
and are you going to do what Jesus did instead of just doing what's popular? Um, Dr. Bob Larson, how has the world of deliverance different today than when it was when you started? Very good question. First of all, uh, there weren't very many of us back then. There are more now. That's good. Uh, secondly, the demons are seemingly stronger. They're more defiant. And back then, you know, we would cast one or two demons out of people. I hardly ever do that anymore. Most everybody's got a, a half a dozen or a dozen. Because there's so many different ways that people get demons today. We had no new age. Nobody was doing yoga. Nobody was mindlessly meditating. Uh, nobody had ever heard of Reiki. Nobody knew about energy healing. That could go on and on. Mm -hmm. This stuff did not exist. Wow. People sinned, but you didn't have a, a meth, an opioid epidemic. Mm -hmm. You didn't have three-fourths of the kids in high school smoking weed. It was a different world. So the demons are bold. They're active. They're defiant. They are in your face today. So it's more challenging to do deliverance today than it was back then. You need more anointing. You need more commitment. You need more dedication. But thank God for people like you and others that God is raising up. Because... Even back then, I was the youngest guy on the block, and I was about your age, and there wasn't anybody else my age mm. doing it. Thank God that today there are young men like yourself being raised up who've got the energy, the enthusiasm, the guts, and the don't care what anybody thinks to go out and do this. Mm -hmm. It's a whole new world today, thank God. And I think the need, I, I like how you highlighted it, the need is so much greater because of the exposure to the witchcraft i mean we have one of the most trending hashtags on TikTok is witch talk which pretty much people are pro showing how they're practicing witchcraft i mean this is something mm -hmm. that before we would see in africa siberia i mean maybe somewhere in the parts of the world where there was no internet there was things were not developed and people just went either to god or to a shaman but i mean we, we're talking about educated young men good looking young women all of, I mean, our generation in our culture are practicing this. And it just seems like that culture now, I mean, people who are leaving the church, they're not going into atheism. They're going into spirituality without Jesus. And now when we would have our conferences on when we, we would have our services, we see the same manifestations, demon, demonic manifestations as we would see in Africa, as we would see in other countries, because the, the witchcraft is so much deeper. And I agree with you that almost every deliverance is, there's like 7, 20, 30 demons um, that are possessing people. Uh, before I, we talk about the mental disorders, would you highlight the difference? And you, you do that really well in your book, in your videos and in your classes about the difference between demons and strongholds and um, and just kind of like what are the main open doors and open doors I know you have open doors for demons and then what are the main strongholds and the difference between those two because some people think they're the same thing could you give us a little difference between demons and this and strongholds before we talk about the disorders very excellent question well you can have a spiritual stronghold in your life and not have a demon uh, it's an area of emotional embedment it's a place in the mind in your identity in your soul in your feelings in your emotive capacities where a demon is attached he may live there mm -hmm. but he may only be attached there this is what most people call oppression it just means that the, whatever that negative feeling whether it is fear or anger or self-hatred uh, rejection a demon is attached to it. Now, mm -hmm. if he's attached long enough, he's going to find a way to worm himself in and get on the inside. A legal right, we teach very clearly in our school of exorcism, is the technicality that a demon holds on to. But if, if you have a legal right, say you practice some form of witchcraft, well, you need to renounce that. Uh, 
get rid of anything involved with that, break the curses attached to it, and then that's a done deal. The demon goes. But a stronghold is different. And I put it this way. A, a, a legal right is how a demon gets there, but a stronghold is how he stays there. So what happens is if the demon gets that stronghold, and it's like he infects the mind mm -hmm. with whatever it is that is his assignment and his identity, be it rebellion, be it uh, depression, be it anger. And then it's not a matter of, of sometimes you cast out those spirits, true. But in most cases, a stronghold is gradually brought down by submitting to Christ, as 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says, by bringing your thoughts captive to be obedient to Christ. But that's mm -hmm. a process. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in your book about dominion, you do a great job of talking about how you, you know, you need to understand for the long haul, there is a battle to be fought here mm -hmm. for dominion of the mind. So that's the essential difference. You, you don't, some strongholds, you can cast out. Yes, sometimes you cast out a spirit of anger, a spirit of rejection. But even if you do that, the mm -hmm. demon behind it may be gone, but the damage he's done to you psychologically remains. And now you have an ongoing battle to get your life restored to what it was intended to be before Satan ravaged it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a very, very good explanation. And uh, Dr. Bob Larson, what is the difference between and how can we differentiate between disorders and demons? And is every disorder a demon or are there some disorders that are just mental and they need medical treatment? Um, could you give us a little bit more explanation before we talk about different disorders? What are the differences between disorders and demons? That's a broad landscape. So let's let's start with the fact that any disorder psychologically, any disordered condition can be either demonically created and energized, or it can be capitalized upon because of a pre-existing psychological condition. And the fine line is asking the right questions to see whether or not the person who is coming for ministry uh, has this condition because of something that appears to be endemic neurologically, uh, perhaps metabolically. There could be all sorts of things in the body that are not in balance, hormones, um, different aspects of the thyroid or the pineal gland. All these things can affect a person's homeostatic condition. So you, you may not be a medical doctor. You may not have a deep knowledge of psychology, but you certainly can ask, ask questions. You know, how long has this person been this way? Uh, what was it that triggered this? That's one of the big ones. Mm -hmm. I, I like to usually say to people, well, have they always been like this? Or was there a certain time? Was there a traumatic incident or some life event mm -hmm. that caused them to shift their mental outlook? What we're looking for is to see to what extent this is medically treatable. It does need some kind of medication. And, and fortunately, medical science can come up with some excellent drugs that, that do help with psychoses and various forms of mental instability. Now, very often there's a demon there you still have to root out, but sometimes you can't get to the demon until you get the person mentally stabilized. Mm -hmm. Not one answer fits all. We need to approach this very, very carefully and ask a lot of questions. This is not a situation where you jump in and just lay hands on somebody and start casting out a demon. That is extremely dangerous. If the person, one of the first questions is, I ask, mm -hmm. uh, if a person says that my son's schizophrenic or says I'm schizophrenic or whatever mm -hmm. they're, they're saying about themselves, has that been medically certified? Have you seen a psychiatrist? Have you seen a psychologist? They signed off on that because mm -hmm. many people self-diagnosis. 
mm-hmm. diagnose. And some family members self-diagnose. You know, mm-hmm. they just make assumptions because this person is having crazy thoughts. Mm-hmm. This may be a demon. I, I know it sounds like a convoluted answer, but it's a convoluted situation. Mm-hmm. And you got to work your way through it gradually. I, I take these things very, very carefully. I study the person. I study their reactions. I watch their behavior. I see if it fits into you know one of the templates I've studied about various um, modalities of emotional expression that may indicate borderline or psychosis or delusional. Now, if somebody comes to me and says, I believe me, the people tell me these things. You know, um, the government has planted a chip in my head and President Biden is monitoring my every every thought. Mm -hmm. And I simply look at them and say, I honestly don't think you're important enough for the United States government to be concerned about what's going on in your mind. I don't mean to insult you, Mm -hmm. but let's have a reality check here. That's not true. Now that's psychosis. Okay. When somebody says I'm hearing voices, That's another matter. Are they dissociative aspects of alter multiple personalities speaking to each other in the mind? Are they demons? Are they aspects of consciousness that have lost touch with reality? That's where you need to take time to ask questions. Okay, what does the voice say? Who does it claim to be? Does it have a name? What is it trying to do? A simple rule to follow, though it's not 100% accurate, is this voice in the mind, this mental instability, Mm -hmm. is it trying to destroy the person or somebody else? If it's trying to destroy them or somebody else, I'm more inclined to think that could be a demon. Mm Mm-hmm. That's good. I'm pausing here. I'll I'll, I'll keep going because no, 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 no. this is the time. It's hard to give a quick answer. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And we have actually, and guys, those of you who are watching, this is a this is a very in depth topic, and we have a, a very soon we're going to release a, an e course where uh, Doctor Bob Larson actually went through this, and we're going to have below in the link his school that I would encourage every person to go through. I went through it. We encourage our team to go through where he actually layer upon layer kind of goes through different mental illnesses and how to deal with them and that. Now, some people might might hear that, uh, Dr. Bob Larson, and they would say, well, you know, Jesus didn't do that. He just cast out demons. You know, there were a few instances where people had mental disorders. He drove out demons. Everything was fine. Um, you guys are bringing a lot of the Western... Um, you know, view into this. This is totally not scriptural. How would you respond to that? I think that's very easy to respond to. So first of all, in the cultural context of the time, there was no development of terminology to describe conditions. So verbally, there was no way for Jesus to explain to people what the condition was. We live in a post-Freudian age, and we use these terms like conscious and subconscious and psychosis, etc. And these are all recently developed words in a little more than 100 years. So that did not exist. The second thing is that the Bible, very often when Jesus cast out a demon, it says he healed them. Mm-hmm. He healed them. So deliverance is also healing, and I believe many times he was actually healing mental conditions like in the case of legion Mm -hmm. the other thing is what we read in the bible are anecdotal accounts where we have a limited description of a phenomenon that might have gone on for some time and there might have been dialogue and conversation and all sorts of things happening jesus didn't always i'm convinced just walk up like that Mm-hmm. and do things. So we do have instances in which he went through several steps to get mm-hmm. somebody healed to deliver. Mm-hmm. So I think there's more that meets the eye here. Yeah. That's very good. The big thing is, conceptually, there was the nomenclature 
to frame it did not exist. So the Bible says he healed them. Mm -hmm. But one more thing that's really important. First of all, the demons today have more curses, curses longer lasting, mm -hmm. and as we've just said, more devastating ways to destroy people's minds. Mm -hmm. They didn't have meth in the time of Jesus. They didn't have opioids. Mm -hmm. They weren't smoking crack cocaine. Mm -hmm. Okay? So those things now have multiplied the mental problems of people. Plus, back then, it was a very close-knit, family-oriented, nuclear culture society. Mm -hmm. Sure, there were people living on the edges of it, but not like what we've got today. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the problems are multiplied today, and, and we need to adjust to the times and bring the deliverance and the healing of Christ as the Holy Spirit in a new age shows us how to do it. Mm -hmm. So good. So good. I I appreciate you highlighting that because I'm, I'm noticing that a lot of people, they, they experience this revelation or this insight or the call of God to cast out demons and and they, they have really successful or effective deliverance ministries. And then they begin to look at every case, especially with autism, you know, uh, learning disorders, schizophrenia, bipolar, um, borderline bipolar. Um, and then they would sometimes even like just cast out the demon. The person is still has the seizures right on the stage or, or in person. No, that's it. You're free. You're, you're gone. And then they go as far as to begin to tell those people to stop taking medication. And um, the medication that, you know, was helpful to them and not with the spiritual problem, with the physical problem that this person had. And I think that a lot of Christians, they don't think that the brain is a physical organ. They somehow think that the brain and the mind is the same. And and we, we, we don't feel, I feel like there's so little education and knowledge, especially in the area of spiritual warfare. They go just all the way into deliverance. And then there's some people who are teaching on mental health so much that they ignore the supernatural component of deliverance and ministry of exorcism. What are the most common mental disorders that you have seen that deliverance ministers mistaken for demons? Well, schizophrenia is right at the top, no question about it. Uh, it is the, the one condition that most closely aligns itself, what we know as demonization. Uh, and, and that is because it is a condition in which people lose touch with reality. And they develop psychosis, which, which basically means that their mind is not properly perceiving reality. So... When, when people start hearing voices or they hear voices telling them to do things that are absolutely absurd, uh, like kill somebody mm -hmm. or harm themselves mm -hmm. or cut themselves or threaten suicide, it's, it's very easy to jump to the conclusion, oh, that is a demon. Not necessarily. Demons do those things. And sometimes demons have created conditions and they just walk away. They mm. go on to somebody else. And this poor person is left with a broken brain, mm -hmm. a broken mind, broken emotions. And so now in that brokenness, they are exhibiting characteristics of demons, but the demons aren't even there. It's just broken. You know, it's like the, the devil comes up and he pushes you and you fall and you break your arm. And he walks, he, just, he goes on to somebody else. He's going to push somebody else over. But you still got a broken arm. Mm -hmm. We got to treat the broken arm. And That's a broken cool. arm, as you put it so well, is like a broken brain. So when people talk about hallucinations, seeing things, hearing things, uh, what I do when, when, somebody is brought to me in a condition like this, I watch the body language. I watch the presence or absence of eye contact. You know, if somebody sits there for 30 minutes and cannot look at me, either a demon doesn't want them to look at me or they are incapable of connecting with another human being because they're living so much in a private world of mental illness. I look for signs of restlessness. So 
demons can make a person restlessness, mm-hmm. but it's an aggressive kind of restlessness. Mm-hmm. But I will tell you this, I've seen some remarkable changes in people's lives once you get past the symptomological aspects of the humanness of the mental illness to the demon that's actually hiding behind it. Mm-hmm. And that's what some people in deliverance don't want to do. Oh, it's autism. You got a demon. Oh, it's schizophrenia. You got a demon. Oh, you're manic depressive. You got a demon. Well, you might, but if you don't go through those processes of healing, you're going to damage that person, drive the demon down deeper and wow. make it less likely they'll get real help. Wow. 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 That's huge. Wow. That's huge. Uh, what are, uh, what are, what is this dissociative this... identity and how common is dissociative identity and how to help somebody who has it in the ministry of deliverance? Dissociative identity disorder simply means, as they used to say in the popular vernacular, a multiple personality. It's, it, 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 it's not schizophrenia. It's not a split personality. It's not Jekyll and Hyde, which are the common misconceptions. So the person isn't split into two different people. They simply have a, a part of the mind that forms another identity. And almost always that is connected to trauma. Mm-hmm. Now, I will say that probably 30 to 40% of the people that I work with who have incurable problems they've been to all kinds of deliverance ministers and they're no better it's because no one diagnosed the fact that they had other identities in their mind so when somebody has a problem and and let's say they're a christian and, and they just no matter what i mean they try all the disciplines they fast they pray they read the bible they they go through inner healing etc etc and there is still a part of them doing something aberrational, oppositional to their faith. Where's that coming from? So sometimes it's not coming from a demon. So let's let's use a case in point. Let's say that Susie was sexually abused as a child. Let's say she was incested, very common. And this happened when she was young. She's never told anybody. She doesn't know how to process this. She lives in this private terror of what her father has done to her. How can she survive without a complete mental collapse? Well, people who can't dissociate develop psychosis and mental illness and states of unreality that's how they deal with it or they use alcohol or drugs Mm -hmm. or sex or something to numb it but for some people particularly if they're a christian and they're in a situation where it's supposed to be christian they they split off a part of them that is the person who experienced the trauma so all the pain all the shame all the emotions of the trauma are locked up in not susie but Mary, and they'll give this person a name. Hmm. And so what you have to do is you, as you work with this person, I, I watch them. I, I ask friends, do they ever act in a regressive way? Like, you know, like they're a child at times. I've had, I've had husbands say to me, ah, my wife's got the biggest teddy bear collection on the planet. I say, bingo. She just loves to cuddle her teddy bears. Okay, what's that all about? How many people do that? They don't. Mm-hmm. So if she, she's doing that, she's regressing. She's regressing, and, and, and when she feels safe, the child comes out. So basically, as we describe it in our school, there's a process by which you learn to spot this, and if you see it, even if you're not well-versed in it, just ask the Holy Spirit to lead you to say, is there anybody inside of Susie who has a secret, something you'd like to tell me? 
I just had a lady in my office a couple of days ago and, and very same thing. And she just broke down weeping, crying and kind of huddled up like a little child. Mm -hmm. And then I just very gently said, what is your name? Who are you? And she began to speak in a very childlike manner and describe sexual abuse she'd experienced. And I said, have you told anybody? No, I can't tell anybody. I'm protecting the big lady. I'm I'm keeping her safe by not letting her know. And oftentimes the person who has an altered state of mind does not have the memory. Somebody else has the memory. But the key is, as they receive healing, the memory starts coming back in a very healthy way. Mm-hmm. And there are people in their healing that know how to do this. Unfortunately, some of the people in their healing that know how to do this don't also cast out demons. Mm -hmm. Because almost always there's going to be a demon attached to that altar state because it's stuck in anger and shame and trauma. Mm -hmm. So good. That's so good. And, uh, and I think it's very important for everybody that's watching and re-watching this video also to understand that, you know, concerning uh, medicine, um, and you, you advised me one time when I asked you, you know, when somebody comes to you and they are taking medication, for example, against depression or they're taking medication uh, prescribed by their doctor or their therapist, um, and you don't encourage people after they get delivered to get off of medicine and pretty much declare no. themselves as healed. What is your process? Well, my process is, is if you're genuinely healed in body or mind, the proof of that is eventually going to come out and you're going to be able to uh, function, but you don't want to come off a of medication quickly. Now you've got another problem mm -hmm. because medications have side effects and, and you can send somebody into a psychotic state. You can, you can really permanently damage that person. Uh, because of what's going to happen to their body that's become dependent on that drug and doesn't have it anymore. That's a physical thing, not a spiritual thing. So what I say to them, look, you go back to your doctor, you go to your clinician, you tell them you believe that the Lord has done a healing with you, and, but you would like to work with them mm -hmm. to gradually get off the medication and to be monitored through that process. Mm -hmm. That brings glory to God. But doctors have horror stories they can tell you of people who claim they were healed of this, claim they were healed of that, and they end up worse later. That's that's so good. That's so good. I think that's such a wise advice to everybody. I'm actually I was reading a, a comment of when you were speaking about the mental illnesses and and one person, and I'm not going to mention her name, but she says, I no longer take my autistic son to church. They always come our way and start trying to cast something out of him and his behavior gets more erratic. I pulled him out quickly and left. And I've seen this actually happen with, especially in Pentecostal churches, charismatic churches, people super zealous. They see, you know, a child. I remember one time we had a person, she had a brain tumor. So because the brain was uh, the tumor was lodged in the brain so she would have seizures and everybody went casting out demons and we had to stop and say whoa 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 you know did anybody even ask what's happening to her she has a seizure she doesn't have a you know a demon not that demons cannot cause seizures but i like how you pointed out we have to ask questions first we can't jump in and treat everything as a demon and use this deliverance as a hammer and everything is a nail. We have to interview, like even Jesus, that boy that was having epileptic seizures, Jesus didn't go cast out demons. He started to ask the father a question. How long did this happen? How did this start? And so interviewing the family, interviewing the uh, people and, and instead of just jumping into that, what would you say about the people or churches who are constantly just going at it right away any autistic children any um or any anybody who's having seizures and they're saying this is demonic we just go uh, hard after it what would you tell them well they mean well in most cases um they they're just not educated in areas of mental health and in areas of physical health and god works through many different ways to bring healing to the mind and body and we need all these disciplines to cooperate. Mm -hmm. So the doctor's not your enemy. 
the psychiatrist may not be your enemy. The, no. the devil may be your enemy, but all these people, unless they are, you know, unless your psychiatrist, and this does happen, says, I want you to go to Tibet and, you know, meditate with the Dalai Lama, then you might want to reconsider what the guy said. Mm -hmm. But approach it very carefully. Educate yourself. <clears throat> then we have this, some, we have something today that's really marvelous. It's called the internet. Mm -hmm. Google the condition. Start reading some of the health sites about what they say about that condition. They're marvelous places that you can look and, and glean information rather than some preacher who stands up and says every child that's autistic, and I saw a guy do this recently on the internet, that this is a demon. If your child's autistic, you got a demon. What a horrible burden that puts upon this parent. I mean, it's awful. Because now, if their child's not better, they don't have enough faith. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not trusting God enough. And uh, that's, that's a guilt trip that is just a horrible thing to put on people. What would you tell parents that have children with mental illnesses? How to um, walk that process of healing, um, deliverance? What encouragement would you give them? Got to adjust my camera here. Oh. Got a little out of adjustment. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, the first the first thing is, uh, have you sought medical advice? Have you got an opinion on this condition? Uh, have you spoken with a clinician about this? Have you seen what they have to say? It doesn't mean you have to accept what they say, but you at least need to listen to what they have to say. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, Pastor Vlad, the majority of people who come to me with cases like this have not taken them to any type of doctor. Hmm. They, they, they're they're anti-doctors, so they don't want to talk to a doctor. Well, okay, but but they're trained. I mean, I have a, as you know, my, my oldest daughter is about to finish medical school and go into the medical profession. And those people know a lot of stuff. They don't have all the answers. They're not God, but they can be of assistance. So let's go through the proper channels here. Mm -hmm. You know, talk to the doctor. The doctor rec may recommend a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a social worker or a clinician of some kind. Let's see what these people have to say observationally about the symptoms. Mm -hmm. The cause is another matter. The cause may or may not be something that's spiritual. But let's see what the symptoms say. Are these common symptoms of someone at this age doing this under these circumstances? Does it fit a predetermined template that a clinician has seen over and over again? Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that you, you know, you're devoid of praying it away, fasting mm -hmm. it away, seeking the Lord to mitigate it. It just means let's find out what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes there is a demon behind it. But you have to expose that demon by stripping away the layers that hide him. The symptomological layers of behavior that allow the demon to hide. And then he's forced out into the open. Now, I remember one time I had a, a man come to me and he brought his son. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, my son is autistic and he has demons. So, you know, I'm thinking very skeptically here. Mm -hmm. And I said, what do you do for a living, sir? And he said, I'm a pediatrician. <laughs> he said, look, I have analyzed this from a medical standpoint, every which direction. And I said, well, if that's the case, I'm going to talk to the demons. And <laughs> a couple of minutes later, I was talking to this little boy's demons. The father had actually gone through my school and was learning how to cast demons out of his son. Now, but there was a medical opinion there. Mm -hmm. He had eliminated all the other possibilities. Christians have to stop this just, we call it mystical thinking, magical thinking, magical thinking that we're going to skip over the medical profession. We're going to skip over the psychiatric profession. We don't need any of that or we're shed. It's of the devil. We're just going to jump over here and get rid of the devil. The person's going to be better. Mm -hmm. Especially if they have dissociative identity disorder and they have an alter state that's trying to protect that person because they've been abused. Guess what? 
you are the new abuser. You wow. mean well, wow. but now this person is going to hide even deeper down wow. inside and you may never be able to help them. Wow. Okay, that that hits that hits straight. You know, this this has been huge for us in the ministry of deliverance and we actually started to even work with local therapists and local counselors with anybody who gets delivered and who had trauma who had abuse you know after we've taken them through the inner healing because we're not counselors i'm not a you know professional counselor um and so and a lot of times what pastors do they think well you know we know three verses you know uh psalm 23 here's you know we're just gonna take them through that that's 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 enough you know apostles did not have those degrees so we don't need to have um you know any of that knowledge but apostles also did not drive a car you know like so the apostles did not do a lot of other things that we all benefit from now we don't have to do those things we can all ride horses yet we take advantage of the technology the advancement of our world we benefit from that to make our life easier but when it comes to mental health when it comes to physical health like nobody would take that approach toward their physical health everybody will go to the doctor and i think that especially in the pentecostals and charismatic circles this anti-doctor or anti-medicine movement and i even had to correct it in our own church one time a person gets up and shares their healing testimony and you know and they're bashing the doctor the doctor said this because the doctor gave them diagnosis and i said i rebuke you devil and i i pulled them back and i said listen the doctor was not the devil he didn't mean you harm he went to 12 years or 14 years of training to help you I'm like, he's not doing this. He wants to kill you. He wants to help you. Why in the world are you attacking the doctor in your testimony? You actually went to the doctor. You're going to go still to the doctor if something bad happens. You're not going to go to me. You're going to go to him. If you get, you know, heart attack, you're not going to call your pastor. You're going to call the emergency. So I'm like, why are you criticizing and bashing the doctor who does not have you, who doesn't see you as an enemy? And I feel like Christians have this, especially the passionate young charismatic and they're, they they mean well they want to glorify God but you don't have to spit on everything that is that God is using currently in order to give God the glory God still gets glorified because he blesses those doctors and so I think we have to add the inner healing component the work of medicine the work of therapist and counseling especially in the area where things are not dealing with demons or we don't have experience in those areas instead of coming in and thinking that we're all pros and we know what we're doing there are things where sometimes we have no idea what we're doing and we have to we have to acknowledge that and say hey i can deal with the demon but when it comes to this i know a little bit and i can help you to begin but after that i have to recommend you to a professional who will see you and as a church a local church here at hungry gen we actually pay for our members for them to go to see those doctors. We actually underwrite the cost because some people say, well, I can't because I can't afford it. So we remove that excuse. The moment people went through deliverance and they still have, or they have had the past hurt. And so that is one of our way we serve the members is we pay for those. We have few local right. therapists and counselors who provide that service. And so, and we work with them closely. And so I just really want to say thank you, uh, Dr. Bob Larson, because you really kind of helped us to understand that. And it, it grieves my heart seeing deliverance ministry that gets all fired up and they hurt like what you said they actually hurt people more not understanding they're not doing it intentionally but they're hurting people more not understanding that um i wanted to ask you um again concerning uh the a little bit more now on the topic of deliverance is self-deliverance possible and to what extent well yes it's possible but it's possible mainly in minor cases of spiritual oppression, not something that's got major internalization of demons that are deeply rooted in highly traumatic experiences or through multi-generational curses that need unraveled and renounced. The problem is, in self-deliverance, you cannot objectify your own internalized mental state or spiritual state. You know, 
That's what the man or woman of God is there for, to speak into your life the things the Lord shows them that you need to correct. Mm -hmm. Well, if you have a problem, often you are the problem. So you cannot be honest enough with yourself. Plus, as a practical matter, let's suppose you're trying to do self-deliverance and you've, you've got a spirit of Lucifer or Leviathan. Mm -hmm. Now, how are you going to get rid of that thing? What are you going to do? Are you going to say, Leviathan, I command you in the name of Jesus to leave me. Ah, I'm not leaving you. No, I command you. It's just ridiculous. You can't, you can't move in and out of mm -hmm. altered states of consciousness, which is what you go through in a deliverance. Mm -hmm. As you know, you, the, you objectify the phenomenon, the demon. You speak to it. You tell it to leave. It responds, no, I'm not because of this, etc. Mm -hmm. And then if you add to that a layer of dissociative identity disorder where other multiple personalities and things are floating around inside their brain. You can't do that. Now, if it's a minor, relatively minor case of spiritual bondage, you can prepare yourself with self-deliverance. Mm -hmm. It's a great tool to get yourself ready for a knowledgeable deliverance minister, but it's not going to get you from zero to 60. Just don't plan on that. That's a good, very, very good um, advice. Somebody was asking a question um, that's worth um, repeating is that does somebody who has a seasonal uh, psychotic episode once or twice in a year needs deliverance or medication? Well, when you have seasonal affective disorder, uh, it, it's, it's often connected with the circadian rhythms. And it's often connected with the position of the sun in the sky and, and how that affects an individual neurologically. So that could get to be quite complicated. You'll used to talk about cabin fever. Mm -hmm. uh, those types of things are, are very, very real. And I think that kind of person can be demonized. Uh, what happens is the demon will, will take a symptom and just make it worse. But, but if you can solve the symptom first, then it exposes the demon. That's good. That's very good. What about somebody, and I know you, ask, you get asked this question a lot. What, are, what about somebody who gets delivered and then they still manifest? Does that mean they didn't get delivered? Because I know they use this against the Ministry of Deliverance, the, the critics of Deliverance Ministry. They're like, oh, look, you know, this person manifested at Bob's ministry. They manifested at this person's ministry. And so, and they're actually even sometimes saying, oh, it's just a show. Uh, could you des describe a little bit or encourage people who are actually are going through a process of deliverance and they didn't get uh, fully delivered at once? I remember I saw this first time at your ministry. That was when I was like 14 or 15 years of age. I met this person who actually had a hole in their tongue and this woman she was I guess dedicated to Satan I don't remember the details now but she was dedicated to Satan and I guess every um, demon in her family marked every generation by making a physical hole in their tongue and so because of that d dedication to demons you know she already got saved she went through deliverance and then at that service in your seminar she manifested again and then you didn't declare her free. You said you received a portion of your deliverance, keep on walking, keep on growing in Christ, and then you will still need more deliverance. Doesn't Jesus just deliver all at once? I mean, or we just simply need more power. Um, so I'm going to play the advocate of the critics right now. So I want sure, you kind of, sure. I want you to address that for people who, who it's, it's usually people who say that have never done deliverance in the first place. But would you address that? <laughs> well, Okay, several things are going on here. Number one, a person may receive their deliverance in stages. The template for this is the children of Israel going into the promised land. Okay, the captain of the host of the Lord said, there's the promised land. It's yours. I've given it to you. Mm -hmm. Well, then why do I have to fight Jericho? Mm -hmm. Why do I have to fight AI? Why do I have to keep going in there with the troops? and defeat the enemy because i'm going to give you the promised possession in stages so that you're going to appreciate what you had to do to invest yourself 
in inhabiting the promised land. So there's the biblical template. So sometimes the Lord has to take us through stages so we truly appreciate what he's doing. Little by little is the biblical phrase. Some people get it all at once. I love it when it happens like that. Mm -hmm. And they're just good to go. But most people, their lives are pretty damaged by the demons. All right. Most of the people who come to me, it's not like, oh, I played with the Ouija board. I got a demon. Get rid of it. Thanks. I'm great. No, 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 no. They went on to 15 other forms of witchcraft that they practice, and everyone opened the door to a different kind of demon. That comes in stages. The healing of the mind and the emotion has to come in stages. Now, there's another phenomenon that I also sometimes warn people about. Once a demon has been in you, psychoneurologically, it knows where all the trigger points are in your mm -hmm. mind, in your emotions, in your body, and you can cast that demon out, and he's like a phantom left behind as if he were there. It's like, you know, we have this phenomenon uh, of, of people who mm -hmm. have lost limbs, and they have a phantom limb, and they will tell you, my, I, I still feel my foot. I still get pain in my foot, even though they've been amputated at the knee. It's a phantom. Mm. And the devil knows how to have that ghost phantom phenomenon to make you think he's still there. I say, look, I'm very definitive when I cast out a demon. I nail it down. I make the demon speak and tell me he's going. And when he does, he's out of there. Mm -hmm. Now, does he have a duplicate of himself? I cast out Jezebel. Maybe you got another Jezebel. In another area of your life, you're going to have to have that Jezebel cast out. And that one's not ready yet because you haven't dealt with that area of your life. Mm -hmm. Or the demon's out there pushing buttons in your brain, making you think he's still around. And you give in to that fear and he will be back. Mm -hmm. So a lot of different things going on. People just need to understand. And I know you know this. I'm preaching to the choir. Deliverance is a process. Yeah. Some people get it in one inoculation, but some people have to have boosters. They need boosters. to keep coming back. The important thing is they need to work out their salvation. Uh -huh. They need to work out that relationship with mm -hmm. Christ. It's about the relationship, not getting rid of the demons. Mm -hmm. It's about growing in grace, growing in knowledge of the mm -hmm. word of God, being in church, having fellowship. And, and the longer you do that, the freer you're going to get. It's, it's a long, long journey. And the other, you know, the question I ask people, I say, okay, look, how many years did you spend screwing up your life? Well, how many years have you spent same. making a mess? Oh, uh -huh. you, you just told me you, you were, you, you've smoked weed for the last 20 years. I mean, this, this is the type of cases mm -hmm. I run into. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and you, you snorted coke for another 10 years. Oh, and you've slept with 50 men. And oh, you've had three abortions. And uh, I see you've tried to commit suicide a half a dozen times. Wow. And uh, you're working on your fourth husband. And I don't mean to pick on a lady. I could have picked a male example. But uh -huh. <laughs> you expect me as the exorcist and deliverance minister to just fix you like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, here's the way I put it. I said, okay, you spent the last 30 years of your life creating a disaster, okay? Mm -hmm. What if it takes another three years to get that fixed? By walking in the word, going to church, fellowshipping, growing in grace, getting uh -huh. continuing prayer. What if it takes another three months? Compared to 30 years, that's not much. Yeah. Start the journey, stay on the journey, until it's finished that's so good and you'll be surprised yeah. how, how fast it will you don't need to spend another 30 years getting fixed mm -hmm. but you need to spend enough time that the holy spirit can teach you some lessons about valuing your freedom so good so good bob i, I could talk to you for a whole night i know your time is very precious i just have a few more questions one thing you told me one time that really stood stood out to me is how a person can do two people can do the same sin and one person can get a demon the other one won't get a demon because of their like emotional or mental resilience or like this this protection that they have could you kind of explain a little bit about that 
moral core. Yeah, moral core. Do you have a moral core that is sound, foundational, resilient, and and even no matter how much you sin or how far you go, there are just certain things you don't do. There's an edge you don't drop off. And where you get that, in most cases, you get it from the family. Wow. If you were raised in a good family and go bad, you've got a moral core. You may stray, but as the scripture says, you will eventually come back. Mm -hmm. Why? The moral core will draw you back. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I ask people, you know, were you raised in a Christian home? Was it a genuine Christian home? Mm -hmm. Not hypocritical. Did, did you have basic values that you were taught? Then I say to them, if that's the case, you'll recover a lot more quickly from what the devil has done. But if you don't have a moral core, you're going to need to learn how to get it. Mm -hmm. How do you get it? Well, the most obvious example is the word of God. Uh, being in a good church, a healthy environment with a good pastor where you're being constantly confirmed in your faith. Mm -hmm. But also there are other ways that you get it. And the internet is great. You got to be careful because <clears throat> there's a lot of crazy stuff out there, mm -hmm. but there's a wealth of information there. A lot of great preachers, a lot of great ministers. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I tell people to do is read Christian classics. Read works which have endured time. Read some of the great pastors, theologians, mm -hmm. and teachers. See what they have to say about this walk of faith. What the first thing I tell people to do almost always is get all my books. No, they, <laughs> I do tell them to do that. And then get Pastor Vlad's book. <laughs> and then but get Pagani's book. And you're and, good and to go. I no. want you to highlight that because you told this to Everett. When Everett uh, was born again at your meeting, you um, and you tell that to new agers, not necessarily to go to feel good churches. And now I see why, Dr. Bob, because now we have students who are so afraid of angels. They're so afraid of supernatural because so much of the supernatural in churches today is borderline new age. And so when you when you bring new agers to salvation or you deliver them you always tell them hey get grounded in the word and actually try to stay away from churches that are super into emotionalism into into that because then you will be pulled back talk about that and and the books that you recommended to everett and to new agers well, you know, there's some, some read mere christianity mm -hmm. start reading cms lewis read that one read screw tape letters read some solid thinking. I, I like to have people read Augustine, Thomas Aquinas. Now that's deep stuff. But but when you when you roll the clock back to where people were, you know, 1500 years ago, mm -hmm. they thought different. Read Martin Luther. Read some of the great theologians if you want to move forward. Read Spurgeon. Read Wigglesworth. Start start reading what deep thinkers have said about the Christian faith and even about the supernatural. Um, there's plenty of time for the woo-woo stuff. You can get to that later if it's if it's your cup of tea. It's, it's The woo-woo is not me, I'm sorry. But, but right now, ground how you process information mm -hmm. spiritually and theologically. And again, I just told somebody the other day, I said, as soon as you're done with the mere Christianity, read Josh McDowell's Evidence That, man that uh, Demands a Verdict. Mm -hmm. And they get my book on world religions and start mm -hmm. plowing through all the different belief systems and see how they contrast to Christianity. Challenge your mind to get to a place where you understand your faith. So of good. course you read the Bible. But you read the Bible a lot for inspiration. You don't read it as an apologetic explanation mm -hmm. of why you believe what you believe mm -hmm. the devil will pick you off quickly so i've given a couple of suggestions here of things that people mm -hmm. so everybody watch it right now who's a new christian read c.s lewis not, not, not the fantasy stuff because that's that's another whole category mm -hmm. read the nonfiction. Mm -hmm. start i guarantee you if 
I cannot tell you how many times I have gone through mere Christianity. Probably a half a dozen times. Because every wow. time I read it, I'm thinking, wow, man, whew, wow. that's why I believe what I believe. Hmm. So do wow, that. Thank you. Train your brain Brilliant to point. think in soundly logical ways about faith. That's good. That's so good. I mean, it reminds me of the verse in the Bible where it says that the sower went out to sow and that the bird, the birds ate the seed. And it represents a person who received the word but did not understand it. It did, didn't say that they didn't experience it. It didn't say they didn't shake and didn't bake and didn't fall and tremble and didn't speak in tongue. But it just says they didn't understand it. And so, and I love that about you, uh, Dr. Bob, is that you're, you know, you're a doctor of divinity, even though you do deliverance and you do that every single day, but you're, you're so well grounded and in your Christian faith and you're teaching young people and others to also ground themselves. In fact, I'm reading Mere Christianity right now. I was reading it this morning. And so um, I am amazed. I'm like, oh my goodness. I mean, I watched Narnia, okay? I thought that's all C.S. Lewis is all about that about 10 years ago. But um, I didn't read. I mean, I read a lot of classics, but not all of them. And so, um, and reading that one is really just reshaping and it's really blessing me. And so I love how you highlighted being moral code, having this moral um, built within you. And you can build it by understanding your faith, by grounding yourself in the teachings, by reading the guys who are dead, not the guys who are bestsellers right now. And a lot of those things are written for sales. They're not written necessarily to impact your soul, but they're written pretty much so guys are making money. And some of the guys who are writing books are not writing books because they have something to say. They're writing books because actually they just became famous. And it's one of the things that you do. The moment your pastor becomes famous, they start writing. Everybody starts writing a book. I mean, I know because I wrote three books and I didn't write when I was famous. But anyway, so we'll close. Well, you gotta write a book. You gotta write a book. Yeah, we, we got to close the whole book uh, book section before I start going to the bad end. Um, two, two more questions and we're going to be done. I appreciate your time. The craziest deliverance you have had or you've experienced, like, the, in your mind that's just like the top the craziest one uh that you have had well there have been several um and as you know just a few weeks ago uh i was assaulted and knocked unconscious and had a concussion that was crazy um after fifty thousand documented exorcisms i had never been knocked unconscious i've had some some things happen <laughs> right after i was at your place and teaching about how be careful deliverance is dangerous <laughs> but i didn't follow my own rules when that happened and i've explained this but but that was crazy that was absolutely crazy uh because what assaulted me wasn't a demon hmm. it was one of these personalities in the mind and so you got to be really careful you can tell a demon where to go and what to do but you can't tell a human being where to go and what to do and if mm. somebody has got a part of their brain that is evil you can't stop it you know i've often said you know people say what would you do if somebody pointed a gun at you and, and they were demon possessed i would say i rebuke you in the name of jesus and then i would duck before the human person pulled the trigger hmm. well in this case i did duck fast enough and it was a fist that that completely knocked me across the room and knocked me out um uh, but I, I think in terms of craziness uh I've had several complex situations that involved multi layers of demons going back 15, 20 generations with a profound moral evil committed in each generation. And then that gets linked back in one particular case to ancient Babylon, to ancient Egypt, and one demon who said i was there in the garden and i immediately put this plan of action this person's identity genetically is rooted in cain wow is that the truth i don't know it was a really nasty demon 
Um, I've had demons say, I go back to Tammuz, um, some obscure Egyptian god that was worshipped. I had one the other day say to me, well, I was right there when Aaron was encouraging people to worship the golden calf. He said, I was the golden calf. I jumped out of the fire. They, they, they thought it was an image. It wasn't an image. It was me. I looked like that. I was that calf. Wow. And they worshiped me. And this woman has Jewish ancestors, which we corroborated later. Wow. I mean, wow. is that true? You know, demons brag, mm -hmm. but sometimes the intensity with which they speak, they tell you things. I had one say to me, I was there when the adder bit Cleopatra. Really? They'll describe to you stuff from antiquity. Now, I don't get caught up in the fascination of that. That's a wrong trail to go down. But mm -hmm. all right. If we need to break the curse of the adder of Cleopatra, let's do it right now. Because mm -hmm. if that's a connection back there, I want to know about it. I had a session today with a gentleman who had one time been a successful businessman with a $25 million business. And then everything collapsed. It went back to an ancestor who was a train robber. Hmm. 150 years ago. And murdered a man. And then when he got shot, they left him laying in the streets. I don't know whether it was tombstone or what. But <laughs> it was mm -hmm. this Wild West story of the body rotting in the middle of the streets. And the, this, this, all of this allowed demons to infest the bloodline and come down and attack this man. It's a wild and crazy world. It's the real wild, wild west out there in the world of deliverance. I don't get fascinated by this stuff, but I try to learn from it. Say, okay, That's good. what other crazy thing might be going on in somebody's life that seems to be erratic and unstable? Is it possible that this is generational. Mm -hmm. And that is the one thing that we miss if we don't ask a lot of questions. That's so good. That's so good. That's so good. Dr. Bob, what Dr. is Bob. the advice for someone who feels called to the Ministry of Deliverance? That's my last question for you today. I know that we're going to have to bring you back because you're not only your, your answers and your your experience is so fascinating, but I know a lot of our people who are watching are really encouraged and really challenged deliverance ministers are being blessed but somebody who's beginning the ministry of deliverance somebody who feels called to the ministry of deliverance what advice would you give them number one is accountability hmm. who are you really accountable to i don't care what your title is i want to know who you're accountable to and i want to know why those people are qualified to hold you to be accountable all right sometimes it's a pastor well sometimes pastors have good boards sometimes they have rubber stamps mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they have good people around them sometimes they have yes people but i want to know if there were people who could call you to account i want to know if there are people who are older wiser deeper than you are mm -hmm. guiding what you do Second thing I tell them is, if you feel like you've got a new revelation from God, put it in writing before you spout off prophetically about it. Hmm. If God's showing you something, put it to peer approval test. That's what the academic community does. Hmm. They come up with some new finding, but they're required to publish it in peer journals so that others who are adept in that area can look at it and evaluate it and see if it passes certain tests of credibility. Mm -hmm. You know what happens in it's especially a lot of charismatic circles today. Somebody gets a revelation of God. Next thing you know, they got a book. Next thing they get, they're spouting it off here and there. There's no checks and balances. Nobody really can dare to ask them any questions. You're quenching the Holy Spirit if you dare to raise any issues about, I don't know, that sounds kind of weird to me. Well, 
Mm-hmm. Okay. So do you have people around you that hold you accountable? And do you put in right? Okay, here, here's the thing. When, when you are forced to intellectually think through the process of a revelation God has given you, can you actually put it in a form that can explain it to somebody else and they can look at it and pray over it and tell you if if this is from the Lord? But we have these lone wolves out there who go out and they write books and they develop theories and they go off over there and nobody, nobody has the right to stand back there and say, whoa, wait a minute here. This is a little odd. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people do get a revelation from God. But then, as you know, they get a prophetic word from the Lord and then they start attaching to it a lot of other stuff that's mm-hmm. really quite personal and it's kind of their own thing you know mm-hmm. and what starts out as a, a, a pure prophetic word from the lord then it becomes corrupted with all well who is who are you asking mm-hmm. I, I will give you a, i won't name a name but i had an individual who started doing something in deliverance ministry i think it was bad i, I don't think it was good but he came to me and uh, I, I called him on it and I said, okay, all I'm asking you is to do one thing for me. You believe this is from God, this new thing in deliverance. You think it is going to be the most wonderful thing to set people free. Okay. Write out a thesis, a short thesis on it. Explain why you believe this from the Lord, how you believe it's going to help people and just put it in paper and send it to me. It doesn't have to be huge. It's Type it up on a sheet of paper. I want to see it right. I want you to see it use words to define what you're doing. Not feelings, not emotions, words. He never contacted me again. Hmm. He couldn't do it or wouldn't do it. Wow. Okay? We all get new things we believe the Lord is showing us from time to time. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really important that we allow it to be tested by our peers and people who will hold us accountable. There's wisdom in a multitude of counselors, the Mm -hmm. mouth of every two uh, two or more witnesses, every truth shall be established. So can we just rein this in a little bit? That's one of my biggest pieces of advice to people in deliverance. You get a new insight from God. Let's, Let's have a consortium of people that you refer to. That's why I like to see, you know, like, I saw this uh, a show you did with Isaiah recently on another individual who was attacking deliverance ministry and you and Mike and Isaiah were all there and you were kicking these. You guys, I was so proud of you guys. Man, you guys were incredible as you took it apart piece by piece and analyzed it and showed the error, I believe, of this other individual's viewpoint. That's great. There are forums like that that we need in the body of Christ and we need in deliverance. I'm so glad to see you guys do that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. That's what we need. Let's just not shout at each other. Let's sit down and say, okay, this is why we do what we do. And you object to that. So we're going to take several different viewpoints of how that's handled. So, we're going to subject it to some peer approval and see whether or not it holds water. This is a sore spot with me so uh, because I've seen so much damage done. Mm-hmm. Let me let me just add this. Through the years, if I had everybody that I mentored, tutored, raised up still with me and sound in their thinking and theology, we'd have the greatest deliverance army on the planet. But I've watched the devil pick them off one by one. Wow. Because... You know how it is in churches. Eventually, everybody thinks they're smarter than the pastor. They know more than the pastor. Mm -hmm. And usually it comes from within the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. But in deliverance, there's always somebody who's found a quicker, faster, better way of doing it. Okay? If you have, I want to know. Because I want to analyze it. I want to pray about it. Mm -hmm. I want us to discuss it. Mm-hmm. You know, but let's talk mm-hmm. about it. Mm-hmm. Let's just not throw it out there and go off on a tangent. And and then what you do is you create a lone wolf who's on his own doing something that ends up in biblical error. Wow. 
I better shut up because this that's this huge. is that's that's this, that's this huge, is but... another whole trail that we can go down. Wow. But but in spite of all of that, and in spite of a lot of things that I see today that make me raise my eyebrows, I'm so thrilled to see the spirit of God at work. Mm -hmm. People young, zealous, out there on fire for God, rattling the cages and telling people. Jesus will set you free. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Guys, drop that fire emoji. Uh, if this has been a blessing to you and Dr. Bob Larson, if somebody wants to learn more about your ministry, if somebody wants to go deeper into understanding from the wealth of knowledge and experience that you have had throughout your ministry, you're sharing that with the world, what they can do to get in contact with your ministry, where can they go to learn more about your ministry? Well, simply go to boblarson.org, boblarson.org. All the information is there, information about our School of Exorcism, uh, our books, the various training methods that we have, and uh, virtual encounters that I do face-to-face -face, in-person sessions with people. Can I add one thing there? I, I do think that's one of the most important things I've done is to stay real and in human touch with people. And to every young pastor who may be listening to me, mm -hmm. don't get too big headed to think you're this figurehead and you're so important. You don't have time. Well, I understand a pastor has busy lives and this is a special calling for me. OK, mm -hmm. it's a it's a counseling calling. It's mm -hmm. a ministry calling. It's a very deeply personal thing. Not everybody can do what I do and, mm -hmm. and pastor a successful church like you do. But at least give some portion of your time to staying in human touch with real needs of real people that's it'll good. keep you real that's so good and so go to boblarson.org and it's all right there and then your school your um supernatural school of uh deliverance what is the well, we have the international school of exorcism which is uh, a very high level of knowledge mm -hmm. and training um you've been through it you know mm -hmm. uh how deep that it goes it's not just about how to get a demon it's about it's about understanding but the whole area of deliverance historically, mm -hmm. biblically, psychologically, the role that angels play, the role that geographical identities play, that soul parts play, that soul ties play, mm -hmm. that it, it is a huge area of study. Mm -hmm. And it's all there for people who want to take it to that level. Mm -hmm. But but I, I'm a firm believer in the more information you can fill your mind with, mm -hmm. you never know. Remember, Jesus said of the Holy Spirit, he will bring to your mind mm -hmm. the things I've said to you. Mm -hmm. It's what he's already said the Holy Spirit's going to bring back. Mm -hmm. So if we fill our minds with knowledge about how to minister to people, the Holy Spirit can pull that piece of information out. And that's what okay. we've tried to create is a resource where the information is there and the Holy Spirit can remind you at the moment of need. So good. So good. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bob Larson. Would you just pray for the viewers, those who are watching? We have about 2000 people that are, uh, that are watching us at the same time uh, right now. And then I know many, many people will be rewatching this as well. Would you just pray a prayer over the young ministers, young people who are going into this ministry of deliverance? Father in heaven, I speak right now to several kinds of people. I ask you the Holy, by the Holy Spirit to target them. Number one, the people who feel called mm -hmm. to this kind of ministry, who feel a tug on their heart, maybe as a result of what they've heard tonight, or maybe as a result of seeing Pastor Glad over and over again minister healing and deliverance to people. Lord, speak to them clearly. You know, there's a price to pay to be in this kind of ministry. Uh, it's not easily and readily accepted. They're, they're going to have to be firm and be bold, be dynamic to go out and do this type of thing. So reach out and touch the hearts of those who say, you know, I resonate with what I heard. Mm -hmm. I think maybe God's calling me to do that. So, so bring them to the right place, whether to our school or Pastor Vlad's school yes. or someplace they could go. But I pray that anointing, that calling yes. will increase upon their lives, that hunger 
to see people rescued from the clutches of the enemy and brought into the fullness of the gospel of Christ. Just increase that hunger and that call upon them. I also pray God for those who are watching, who are listening to this and say, yes, I think these two men are talking about me mm. and my problems and the things that I'm facing. And I don't know what to do. Lord, help them not to stop there, to contact me, to contact Pastor Vlad, to reach out to somebody who can in a very direct way minister to their need. Mm. Help them, Lord, not to let the devil steal mm. that seed that's been sown tonight. Thank you, Lord. Let that ground of their heart be fertile for that yes, seed of, I need to get this kind of help. Mm. I need to give this get this kind of ministry in my life to grow. And, and Lord, as we started tonight, our hearts are so deeply overwhelmed with pain and hurt for the people of Ukraine, especially the Christian people there, yeah. who are the bedrock of this nation, people of faith. Lord, increase the giving Yes, Lord. The openness yes, of the hearts of people yes. to this mission that Pastor Vlad is embarking upon. Bless them so far above and beyond any expectation that they would have to carry this kind of help to these desperate people who have left all behind to begin a new life. And every plan the enemy has to bring hurt and harm or to hinder this in any way. Clear the path before them. Yes, we bind every evil spirit. has yes, got an assignment yes, right yes, now to tell yes, people not to give, not to open up their hearts, and to hinder this mission going forward. Yes, A blessing, blessing, blessings rest upon Pastor yes, Vlad, his people, and everybody who is part of that team. Keep them safe, keep yes, them strong, keep yes, them Lord. focused and keep them abundantly blessed in every way. Thank you, Jesus. And we just thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We minister to people in your name because you first set us free. You healed us. You set us free from the powers of darkness. Yes, and we give you the glory, praise, honor, and just thank you for the privilege thank you, of ministering to the souls for whom you died. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. amen. And bless amen. this man of God. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Bob you. Larson. And, you know, every single time I bring a guest, I give him also an honorarium and a blessing. And Dr. Bob Larson today said, he said, hey, I want to, everything that you are planning to bless me, I wanted to go to Ukraine relief. Um, I want to support this. So I just want to say thank you again for what you poured into the country of Ukraine. I want to say thank you for what you poured into ministries of deliverance. And we're taking that mental and we're carrying it and going further. Thank you for being that spiritual father, that general and that pioneer for us younger ones. And we thank honor, you. we respect you. Um, and so it just means a lot to us that we have somebody's shoulder to stand on who is not afraid and who is not insecure to share what they've learned and propel and encourage and we just really honored so just huge huge thank you thank you my wife's watching right now she's crying she's probably wiping away tears right now i'm blessed i'm blessed you bless my heart so much thank you thank you guys uh thank you uh, thank and you're you. going to be on my show in a couple of weeks yes yes i will be we'll look on, is now but i'm looking forward to that very very much we got to keep this synergy going 